Matthew 26. Matthew 26. While you're turning there, uh, I will tell you that had God given me the option, if God would have said to me, do you want to be a singer or do you want to be a preacher? I would have put singer in a heartbeat. I've got the name for it. I could have come out with it's not unusual. I could have done that. But I didn't. Uh, but I love music. I love singing. I've always envied these people that could get up and sing and it just acts like it just falls out. You know, without it being an effort. And uh, I never could... I never could figure out songwriting. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't flow. But not long ago, a thought came to my mind, and I, I kind of got the chorus of a song, and, and I'd like to someday put the rest of it together. But there is no, there's no, uh, I can't even think of the word, there's no, not rhythm, that's not the word, no melody. There's no melody in my mind that goes along with it. But sometime back, I was thinking about being, uh, being committed to God. Uh, uh, I, I was thinking about surrendering to God. What does it mean to be totally and completely surrendered to God? And then sometimes what, I mean, we all know if, if, if you've been saved any amount of time, if, if you're familiar with the scripture at all, you certainly must know that surrender is something that's taught in God's word. One of my great concerns is that so many people today want just enough of God that they feel like they'll go to heaven when they die. But they don't want so much of God that He will interfere with their life while they're living here on earth. You understand what I mean? Quite frankly, folks, that's using God. And we're not fooling God, we're only fooling ourselves. You see, we cannot call Him our Savior without also calling Him our Lord. And by calling Him our Lord, it means that we surrender to Him. But I got to thinking about what might come between us and surrendering to Christ. And so this little chorus came into my mind. Between me and surrender, there are choices to be made. Between me and surrender, there are prices to be paid. I believe my spirit's willing, but my flesh is so weak. So Lord, help me surrender and to surrender all of me. And tonight I'm going to speak on the subject between me and surrender. I think in the book of Matthew chapter 26, we see one of the most incredible stories in all of the Bible. What I want to focus on tonight starts in verse 36 of the book of Matthew, chapter 26. I'll be reading from the King James Version. If you're reading from a, another version, you should see similarity. Verse 36, then Jesus cometh, or then cometh Jesus with them. Now the with them here, with them here would be the disciples. Now at this particular point, there are 12 disciples, but... But Judas is one of them. And at this particular point in time, Judas has left from what we commonly call the Last Supper, and he has gone to betray Jesus. So he is no longer present physically with them. So Jesus and the other 11 disciples go to a place <clears throat> that is very familiar to them. Let me start reading verse 36 again. Then cometh Jesus with them... <coughs> unto a place called Gethsemane. And he saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went 
a little further. Now Luke records that he went about a stone <coughs> throw away. Now it would depend on how good of an arm you would have and how far that would be. On some days, Ben Roethlisberger could throw it a long way. <laughs> and on some days, it seemed like he couldn't. Did anybody here ever throw the shot put in track? No? Wow. Well, <laughs> now when I was in school, I was probably, I was a lot like Luke. I was a slender fella, weighed 155 pounds when I got married. But there's been a lot of chickens that have given their lives <laughs> in the past <laughs> <laughs> <of the> years. <laughs> and and uh, I'm, uh, anyway, I weigh a little bit more than 155 now. <laughs> Where was I headed with that? I completely lost track of what I was. <laughs> what? Oh, the shot put. And so in, uh, when I was in like the ninth grade, I decided that I was going to run track. And so one of the options was the shot put. How many of you have watched them throw the shot put? You know, they get that, they got that like a big metal ball, like a cannonball kind of thing. You know, when they get it positioned, these, these are usually big guys, big hosses. And, they, and you know, here was this little bitty skinny guy. And, I've got this thing under my, you know, you've got to get it positioned just right, and you know, and you, and you turn, and you, and you get the momentum, and then you finally push it. Well, you know, some of these guys were throwing, I had to pull my toes back to keep it from landing on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew right away, shot put wasn't for me. So but the, the point here is that, keep in mind, now Jesus has told eight of disciples, you stay here. And he takes Peter, James, and John a little bit farther with him, and he says, now you guys... Carry with me and pray. But then Jesus went about a stone's, you know, who knows, how, however, what, 30 yards? I don't know. 40, I don't know. 40 yards? However far? I, I don't know. But that's very important, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Verse 39 again, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me. Now here's the most important word, in my opinion, in this whole passage. And if you mark in your Bibles, I would suggest that you underline this next word. Jesus is praying with everything in him. Luke records that Jesus prayed until his sweat became as great drops of blood. Now, I've heard different explanations about what that means. I don't know. But I will tell you this, that Jesus was in earnest, heartfelt, agonizing prayer about this issue. Luke also records that an angel comes and ministers to Jesus there in the garden. I'm telling you, Jesus was in great distress of this situation. And he says, Father, please, if there's any other way, please, let's do it. Then he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, that's coming to the point of surrender. <coughs> when you say, I don't want to do this, but you say, but God, your will is more important in my life than my will. Let's go on down. In verse 40, and he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh to his disciple, then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. And then in verse 46, Rise, rise, let us, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Three things I want to point out to us tonight about how to remove the things that are between us and surrender. Number one, get along with God. Get along with God. 
Now, you've got to understand, I'm not talking about devotions here. Now, devotions are important. And I'm not even talking about individual prayer, although individual prayer is important. What I'm talking about by getting along with God is coming face to face with who you are. You know, they estimate that there are some 7 billion people on the face of this earth. And unless you are an identical twin, you have DNA in your cell structure that is unique from everybody else on the face of the earth. At the moment of your conception, the, the reproductive cell from your biological father join together with the reproductive cell from your biological mother. Every cell in your body has 46 chromosomes, except for the reproductive cells. The female reproductive cell has four, 23 chromosomes. The male reproductive cell has 23 chromosomes. When, that, when, that, when, that, when those two re reproductive cells come together and they fuse, at that very moment in your mother's body, and ladies, those of you who have given birth to children, oh, what a miracle occurs inside the human body. Because at that very moment, with all of the trillions of cells that comprise your body, there is a single cell in your body that has DNA that is completely different from all of the other cells in your body. And you see, when you were conceived, at the moment of your conception, which, by the way, was no accident in God's eyes. You see, if God does not play a role in you being conceived and you being who you are, then your very fact, I'm going to be careful how I say this, you have a better chance of winning the lottery than you did of being born. Now, I'm not going to go into all the science in that tonight. My point is this. God had a plan and God had a purpose for you at the moment of your conception. I believe that with all of my heart. And that DNA makeup... That genotype, it would later turn into a phenotype. The, the genotype is the genetic makeup. The phenotype is your physical appearance. My phenotype means I'm short and round. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to have dark hair, but now it's, you know, now it's not. When I pastored in the south, I had dark hair. When I, pastored, started, when I started pastoring in the north, my hair turned gray. <laughs> Maybe it had something to do with 20 years of time passing. I don't know. <laughs> But here's my point. Here's my point. Now, <clears throat> I do a lot of counseling anymore. And in fact, I'm about halfway through a master's degree in professional counseling through Liberty University's online master's program. And I'm learning a lot about human makeup and, and human behavior. And to me, it's a fascinating thing. What makes you act like you act and do the things you do I believe had a lot to do with your environment. Now, your physical appearance, that's set by genetics, okay? I don't care. I can, I can concentrate. I can close my eyeballs. I can, I'm not going to grow any taller. I don't have to try hard to grow out round, but I'm not going to grow any taller. I don't care what I do. I'm not going to grow any taller. That's decided. But who I am as an individual was decided by God. But here's what happens to people. I have had people, men and women, sitting in my office. 40s, 50s, 30s, 60s. Who will look at me and say, Pastor, I have no idea who I am. That's a sad thought. And there may be some of you sitting here tonight that down deep in your heart, you have no idea who you are. And let me tell you how I believe that happens. You see, I believe that, we're, that, that, that we are sort of like an onion, if you will. That, that person that God created you to be is sort of like the center of that onion, if you will. That's who God created you to be. That's who you really are. But then we're born. 
And then very early in life, we start experiencing things. And we all know, and, and, and the Bible says, man is born a woman few days and is full of troubles. We know there's struggles. We know there's pain. They, we know that there's things that we deal with. And, 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 and things happen to us that hurts us. And, and, we, and we build a layer of protection. And we say, I'll never let that hurt me again. And then the next thing you know, we build another layer. And we build another layer. And we build another layer. Till sooner or later, we have no idea who that person was meant to be on the inside of that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm talking about by getting along with God. You see, when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane that night, this was not a teaching moment for the disciples. That's not what this is about. For the last three and a half years approximately, the disciples, as far as we can tell, must have spent most day and night with Jesus. They had left their job. Some of them were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. They had left their way of making a living, perhaps even gone away from their families most of the time, and had followed Jesus. And there had been many teachable moments with Jesus and his disciples. But this night, in the Garden of Gethsemane, this was not a learning opportunity for the disciples. For you see, God, Jesus left the eight of the disciples over here. He took Peter, James, and John a little bit farther. And then he probably <coughs> went far enough that they really could not hear what was going on. And he became face to face with who he was. You see, it's hard for us to, to fathom this. Because Jesus was both God and man. That's hard for us to understand. But... The fleshly part of Jesus, the G God incarnate, Christos, the, the Messiah, the deliverer, who Jesus was, was born for that very thing. Jesus was not born into this world to become famous, nor was he born into this world to become rich. He was not born into this world so books would be written about him. He was born into this world to be my Redeemer and your Redeemer because of the sins that I have sinned. And because had He not done that, I would be doomed for eternity in a lake of fire called hell. Right. This is the very reason Jesus came to this earth. And that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, He came face to face with who He was. When I first met Pam, when we were 15 years old, I believed, I don't have time this, morning, this evening to go into all the details, I believed that I was damaged goods. I believed there was something wrong with me. My dad didn't want to stay home. My dad would be home a lot of times, but he wasn't there when he was there. You understand what I'm talking about? We were just a part of his life. And sometimes it seemed like we were in his way. It seemed like the life that he really wanted was out there with other women and other people and other friends. And you see, when you're born as a human being, there's just something instinctively put in you that says biological father and biological mother should love you. And as a child, you believe that's the way it is. And so since daddies, so since little boys and little girls think daddies love their children, then the only reason daddy doesn't want to be with me is because there's something wrong with me. Some of you here tonight know what I'm talking about. There's something wrong with me because after all, daddies love their boys and girls. They would never do that. I've counseled with a woman who was sexually abused from the age of five by her biological father. Sit in my office and weep and cry. And say she felt like she had to be garbage because there must have been something wrong with her. Because daddies don't do that to their little girls. And she's right. Daddies that don't have things messed up in their minds don't do that because that's not natural affection. Right. Children that are physically abused. I had a guy sit in my office who told me when he was four years old, 
That one time he did something to make his mad dad, his dad mad, his dad kicked him down a flight of steps and he rolled down the steps till he was hit the bottom. And I said, tell me something. At age four, what could have you have done to deserve that? He said, oh, he said, I was a bad kid. I said, you were four years old. What could have you done at age four that made your father kick you down those steps? And he thought about it and I said, you have children. What could your children do that would be bad enough that you would kick them down a flight of steps? And he thought about it and he said, nothing. I said, that's exactly right. I said, so who had the problem, you or your father? And I've seen them well up and start to cry when they realize dad had something wrong with him. Or maybe mom had something wrong with her. You see what I'm saying, folks? You can never really surrender to God. You can never really learn to love God the way you should until you are able to love yourself. Well, I started to tell you a bit ago when I met Pam when I was 15, I didn't let her see the real me. I hid that from her. Because I was convinced that if she knew me, she'd be gone. She'd be foolish to stay with me. She and I have been married for 34 years. It's only within the last three or four years I've begun to open up. My girls are grown. Our oldest daughter just turned 33 the other day. Back the sixth, whatever day that was. Today's the ninth. You do the math. <laughs> um, and all of our girls, we have three adult daughters. We have four grandchildren. Our youngest daughter's pregnant, expecting our fifth grandchild. But all of my girls' lives, I kept them at an arm's distance. Well, I told them I loved them, and I said I loved them, but I kept them at an arm's distance. Because, you see, I thought that if my girls really knew me, they wouldn't want anything to do with their dad. It's because I believed I was damaged goods. But now God has helped me to see that that's not the case. There wasn't anything wrong. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was a kid. I was a, I was a little punk kid. Yeah, I know that. And I did things to deserve to get in trouble. But I now realize that, that the issues weren't mine. They were my dad's. I'm happy to tell you my dad has given his heart to Jesus. And he's a different man than he used to be. And I've got to tell you, I still struggle with that from time to time. I think about three Old Testament characters, well, two Old Testament characters and a, and a New Testament character. I think about the Old Testament character, Jacob. The name Jacob means trickster or deceiver. And, and, and Jacob came to a point in his life one day when he had to come face to face with who he was. You see, he had, Jacob had tricked everybody around him. And he had even defrauded his own twin brother. And his brother said, if I ever meet up with Jacob, he's a dead man. And Jacob believed it. Well, long story short, there comes a time now that Jacob and Esau are about to meet. And now God has already told Jacob, Jacob, I have a job for you. You will be the father of the sons that will comprise the nation of Israel. And it's through the nation of Israel that the Messiah will be born so that those who believe in him can be saved from their sins. But Jacob comes up with a plan. And he says part of his possessions one way and part of his possessions another way. And finally he sends his wife and his children away and he goes across this brook all by himself. I've thought about this story a lot of times. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, uh, Jacob finds himself in a wrestling match. Now, could you imagine? You're scared to death thinking your, your brother's about to kill you. And now you're out in the woods or desert, wherever he was, and it's pitch dark and you can't see anything. And all of a sudden, you're in this wrestling match? <laughs> I think I've been doing some crying for mommy. I don't know about but somebody else. But you know, that's a serious situation. But he's wrestling with God. And it's about to become daylight. And, 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 and uh, the, the, the God says, let me go. And he said, I won't let you go till you bless me. And he said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. Now, we hear Jacob. We just think Jacob. But what he was saying is, my name is Deceiver. God said, that's right. I'm changing your name to Israel, which means the Prince of God. 
Then I read a story about Elijah. Elijah was a powerful prophet, a man of God. We see all these miracles happen in his life. But then he gets word that Jezebel is out to get him. And man, he gets out of there as fast as he can go. And he gets depressed and he finally lays down under a tree. And he prays and he says, all right, God. Basically what he said, put it in my terms. Basically, all right, God, we gave up a good fight. But it's over. Go ahead and let me die. Elijah had no idea that he would be one of only two men throughout the history of mankind that would never die. My, my belief is if you ask Elijah that night, Elijah, what's your name? He'd say, my name is Fear. I'm running for my life. And then Peter, a little bit later after the text that I read tonight, when he betrayed Jesus, and he went out and he wept bitterly because of the fact that he had just denied knowing Christ. In my opinion, if you would have asked Peter that night, tell me what your name is, he would have said, my name is failure. I have failed. But I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. First of all, <coughs> you've got to get along with God. You've got you to figure it out. Who, is, who am I, God? And you say, well, pastor, or, 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 I'm sorry, I'm used to call referring to myself as pastor. You say, but Tom, how, how, how do I do that? You might need to get some help doing that. You might need to talk to somebody to do that. But I'm telling you, God knows who you are. Yes. And he wants you to know who you really are. Not only must we get along with God, secondly, we must get honest with God. That's what, Jesus, I'm saying, that's what Jesus was doing. Did you know that? You see, it's okay to pour your heart out to God. You say, what are you talking about? If you're mad, tell him you're mad. You know what? He already knows it. You're not hiding anything from him. Now, I know how it is on Sunday mornings sometimes. Those of you that drive a distance, maybe to church. Pam and I have been there with three kids. You know, one of those, you start out one of those mornings and no matter what clothes you lay out, they're not the right clothes for the kids. No matter what you fix them to eat, that's not what they wanted that day. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Either the husband wakes up a little grumpy that morning or the wife wakes up grumpy that morning or both. That's true. And you fight before you get in the car to go to church. Amen. And you fight all the way there. <laughs> But you get out in the parking lot and you shut the door and everybody puts a smile on their face, right? Everybody's happy, everybody's in a good mood, and everybody loves Jesus. I mean, anybody, anybody, you know you've been there. If you haven't yet, you will be someday. And then when church is over, you go get back in the car. You guys know where this is headed, don't you? Where nobody can hear you and you shut the Where were we? I think we were saying something about your mother. <laughs> You're just like your mother. I could go on and on and on on this. Am I right? Yes. You see, we can hide it from other people, but you're not hiding anything from God. Mm. Are you scared? Mm. Tell God you're scared. He can handle it. God's big and powerful. He spoke this world into existence. Yes. Right. He can handle it. He couldn't handle you being on. You see, that's why when Jesus was in the garden that night praying and saying, Father, I'm asking you if there's any other way, let it be. And God didn't say, what are you talking about, boy? I'm so disappointed in you. No, God didn't do that. You see, there had been a plan all the way back in eternity past. And Jesus knew that. Right. But now, the moment has come. He who had never known sin was about to have all of the sins of mankind placed upon him. And I believe the part of Jesus was dealing with that night was he didn't want to face the physical pain that would be involved. But I believe with all of my heart that the biggest thing was becoming sin for us. For us. And the shame of hanging on a tree. The Bible says, cursed is he 
that hangeth on a tree. It was an embarrassment. It was a shame-filled thing to die on that cross. You see, it's okay to get honest with God. He can take it. it, it it's happened before. In fact, I, I, I'm not going to take the time uh, today to read it, but in, in Psalm 142, the psalmist is pouring out his heart. Listen, if, if you don't believe it's okay to be honest with God, study some of the psalms. My goodness, some of the things David prayed. Yes. I'm thinking, David, you sure about that there, Davy boy? Maybe you ought to rethink that. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, if we prayed a prayer today and David prayed, Whoa. and he got to the press, whoo, look out. I'm talking about, David said, God, just kill my enemies. I'm tired of them. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yes. <laughs> God, give me. Kill him. <laughs> I'm tired of him hounding me. That's right. Every day. I'm tired of living in a cave where I could be living back home in a palace. That's right. Terrible 140. And then he, he turned. He turned over. I started to say you can turn over to Psalm 142 and read it. He said, I pour out my complaints. <laughs> Nate and I, we have a, a lady that comes in two days a week and works as a volunteer secretary and we tell people that she is now our complaint department. <laughs> so we have a complaint. Take it to Gladys. Um, but the point is this, and i got to hurry along. The point is this. Be honest with God. It's okay. And one final thing I have to hit on before I move to the final point is one of the things about honesty is that it really helps us. I want you to turn to the 73rd Psalm. If I run out a little bit of time here, uh, take it out the next time I come up, if there is a next time. <laughs> if you invite me back up, I'll owe you some time. <laughs> psalm 73 is an incredible psalm. It's written by a man, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, is Asaph. And in this psalm, well, let me just start reading. Verse 1. Truly... Asaph says, God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. I think we would all echo that, right? Which a amen, Asaph, that's good preaching. Go ahead and write that song, brother, and sing it loud. Because we agree with that. That's good stuff. But look at what he says in the next verse. But as for me, wow. Ace is saying, God is good to all those that love him. But as for me, he said. You see, folks, for years and years, I've been a pastor since I was 19 years old. I turned 50, well, actually 23 just the other day. <laughs> I turned 52 just the other day. So you do the math. I've been doing this for a while. And I could stand and preach to people all day long that God loves you just like you are and believe it. But I struggled to apply it to my own life. For you see, I don't know what goes on in your heart and mine, but I know what goes on in mine. And I'm thinking, God, I'm damaged. Even you can't really love, not me, God, not me. And that's what Asaph was saying. Asaph said, Asaph said, God's good to Israel, all those that, that, that have a clean heart. But in verse 2, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He said, I was about to fall out of things. I was, my feet was on, my feet was on unstable ground. It was like, you ever tried to, well, this is eerie. You guys know what I'm talking about. You tried to walk on icy sidewalks or whatever. And how many of you ever, how many of you have ever heard that saying, looks like a cow on ice? How many, how many of you ever heard that saying? Wow. <laughs> Guess I better throw that one out. That's just a very southern term. And talk about somebody looking like a cow on ice. Now, if you've never seen this picture, you've missed out. Do a search on YouTube and see if you can find it. It'd be worth to see it. A cow walks out on ice, and their feet just start going everywhere. Because they have no grip, they can't. So in the South, they would talk about somebody being as, as graceful as a cow on ice, and that's a 
That's an insult, obviously. <laughs> I guess being called a cow would be an insult in and of itself. A high just makes it that much worse. But I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, strike that from the records. He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My, my steps had well nigh slipped. Now get this. For I was envious at the foolish. Why I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You ever been there and done that? Jesus, I don't understand what's going on here. I'm trying to live for you. It seems like all I'm getting is trouble. And staying broke. <laughs> and yet these people that don't even serve you, God, just seem like they never have any problems. Life just as smooth as can be. Verse 4, for there are, there are no bands in their debt, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Now, first of all, you've got to understand, what he's seeing or what he's thinking is true is not really true. Because there is nobody that goes through life that doesn't have struggles and problems. I don't care who they are. Let's go on down. Verse 6, therefore pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than they could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. Or concerning oppression they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return thither or hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how does God know? Does that sound like our culture today? People living like they want to live and pointing their finger at God, thumbing their nose at God. How is God going to do about it? Wow, what a thing to say. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. I want you to notice what Asaph says next. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. Do you know what Ace is saying here? I have wasted my time trying to serve God. Mm. Folks, this man was in a dangerous place. He said, I've wasted my time. What good is it to me? Folks, I've worked with people in the years of my, and being in the ministry, I've, I've worked with people down through the years that have been in that same situation. What good is it to me to serve God? Now, it's get, because people get their view of God completely out of whack and everything starts getting messed up. You see, Asaph's thinking was all wrong. Now, let's go on down. Verse 14. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I shall offend, offend against the generation of thy children. I get this. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Asa said I couldn't even bear to think about it. Asa got honest with where he was. But oh, in the next verse, things start to change. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Right. <laughs> Notice what it said, then understood I their end. You see, when Asaph got things fixed up with God, these people he was mad at before, now he's looking at them through eyes of mercy. He said, because now I understand their end. Verse 18, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them <coughs> down into destruction. How they are brought into desolation is in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terror. As a dream, when one asketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt, thou shalt despise their image. <clears throat> Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Amen. And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Amen. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all of them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy works. Amen.
you see, honesty with where Asaph was brought him back into it, brought him to the point that he could get things fixed up with God. And then he looked at life completely differently. Thirdly and finally, I'll go through this one quickly. Not only must we get alone with God, not only must we pour our, or get honest with God, the third thing we need to do is get going for God. Hmm. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he got alone with God. And he got honest with God. And then he got going. Hmm. Don't fool yourselves for a, phone, a second, folks. Jesus knew exactly what he was facing on the other side of that garden. He went back to his disciples and they were asleep. And he said, what? Could you not watch with me just for a little while? He went back and prayed. Three times he prayed. And finally he came back and he said, all right, take your rest. And then he said, rise, let us be going. And if you look right down in Matthew chapter 26, <clears throat> said in verse 47, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, and came with him, or came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. Now, I don't have time to go into the rest of this. But I want you to understand that one of the things you've got to do to get going with God is you've got to face the challenges that are before you. Yes. I want to go back to my three friends real quickly, Jacob, Elijah, and Peter. I want you to understand that just because God changed Jacob's name that night to Israel didn't mean that everything was smooth sailing for him then on, mm -hmm. for him from then on. He still faced challenges. And, and just because Elijah, now I don't have time to tell you the rest of the story about Elijah other than that he survived it. He went to a cave. God talked to him there and in a still small voice he said, Elijah, get out of this cave. I'm not done with you yet. I've got two, I've got two kings and a prophet you need to anoint. Elijah, get out of this cave. But Elijah still had to face challenges. Peter, when, when he felt like a failure that night, had no idea that approximately within, uh, uh, of course this is there for Passover, and then day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after. So some 50 days after this event this night, Peter is going to stand before a multitude of people, and he's going to preach one of the most simple messages I've ever seen in my life. That message would fail every homiletics class in every seminary in the world. Any homiletics professor would take that message that Peter, if he put it together and gone to his homiletics professor and said, Professor, tell me what you think about this message, the professor would probably look at him and say, Son, I think you missed your calling. I mean, look at this, son. There's, there's no flow. There's no humorous anecdote at the beginning of it. There's not three points. There's no poem. Where's your poem? People can't get saved without a poem. What are you doing? <laughs> but yet Peter stood and preached a simple message. And some 3,000 people gave their heart to Jesus. Now Peter would face challenges. History tells us that he was crucified upside down on a cross. The Bible doesn't teach us that, but history does. Peter faced challenges. Listen to me. If you're going to surrender to God, you will face challenges. But the only thing you can do is just keep going. You can't quit. You can't turn tail and run. You just got to keep going. Face challenges. Sorry, I forgot what my next part is. I've got to look at it in my, my notes. Follow God's plan for you. Jesus was following God's plan. Now let me end with this. Finish the task. One of my mentors, Tryman Messer, a man that I love with all my heart, Daryl Lothian, some of the other guys here know him. Tryman Messer, I, I would literally take a bullet for the man. One of my heroes in the faith. Fifth grade education. But I believe the man, in my opinion, has as much godly wisdom as any man as I've ever met in my life. And he said to me one time, he said, Tom, we have a lot of strong starters, but we don't have many strong finishers. You see, Jesus that night in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed and he said, oh God, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me. But he faced the challenges. He followed God's plan and he finished the task. 
You read on over again. I don't have time to go there and, and look at it tonight. But Jesus was hanging on the cross. Beaten beyond the point of recognition, most likely. Crown of thorns beaten down on his head. His back beaten. Probably mostly unrecognizable. And he's hanging there on the cross. And he looks out at those that are making fun of him. And he says, Father, forgive them for what they do. And then a little bit later, Jesus says, it is finished. And the plan of redemption for you and me was completed. That's right. That night. That's right. That's why it's not your baptism that will get right. you to heaven. Right. It's not your church attendance That's right. that will get you to heaven. It's not the good things in your life that you do that will get you to heaven. It's you being in faith That's with right. Jesus Christ yeah. and His finished work in your life that places you in right standing with God. Yeah. That's why Paul said, for by grace are you saved. Through faith. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. I'm asking you tonight. Are you surrendered? What's between you and surrender? Are you here tonight and you're saved? But there's something holding you back from taking that final step of surrender? Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. And tonight he's speaking to you. With the arms outstretched, he's saying to you, I love you with all of your flaws. Everything about you, I love you. I will accept you right now. Please come to me. Maybe one time you lived close to God, but things have happened in your life. And you feel a little bit like Asaph. I don't know if I want anything to do with this or not. But tonight, God's speaking to your heart. And he's saying, I love you. Tim Ponzetti is a man in our church. Was an Elvis impersonator for 18 years. Still has the Elvis hairstyle. <laughs> Still sings on Sunday mornings on occasion. Still sounds like Elvis. He says, I get tired of people calling me Elvis. I said, well, then cut your hair. But anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> Sorry, I get off on sidetracks every now and then. Tim became so angry at God because Tim's dad had, uh, I think it was uh, aneurysm surgery. And as he puts it, the doctors kept botching it, and, and his dad ultimately died. And he went to the same chapel where he had been praying for his dad. After his dad died, he went back to that same chapel and told God how much he hated him. Mm -hmm. And how mad he was at him for letting his dad die. Mm -hmm. And for, I guess, 20 years or whatever, several years went by. And every time Tim would think of God, he'd think about how bad he hated him. Mm -hmm. One Sunday morning, he was sitting in church, and God got a hold of his heart. Yeah. And he came forward and gave his heart to Jesus. Yeah. And if he were standing here today, he'd be smiling ear to ear. He would be talking about him needing to get his hair cut. He'd be <laughs> smiling ear to ear. And he'd stand up and he'd tell you now how much he loves Jesus. I told him, I said, Tim, all those years you were telling God how much you hated him. I said, God was saying, I know you do, Tim. I love you. I don't care how you feel about God tonight. God's saying I love you. And I want you to come to me. Bow your head with me, please.